So we're going to be talking about the art world today. We have three very different authors and with very different experiences of the art world today with us. I'm going to read their bios quickly. There's truncated bios. If they want to add anything, they, they, can, they can correct me. Uh, starting with the, the furthest away from me over here on my right is Nancy Boas. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Okay. She is the author of a new illustrated biography available after um, this ends in the lobby here. It's called David Park, A Painter's Life. And she also wrote an earlier book, The Society of Six California Colorists. And both were published by the University of California Press, yet another sponsor of ours. So mm -hmm. we're happy to have uh, one of their authors here. She was adjunct curator of American paintings at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. Next, we have Jonathan Keats. He's a writer and an artist, and his latest book is called Forged, Why Fakes Are the Great Art of Our Age, and it's forthcoming from Oxford University Press, and we have a few other titles um, of his out in the lobby. He's exhibited at venues including the Berkeley Art Museum and Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and you can pick up a poster right here for his, uh, is it, has that opened already, or is it, it's upcoming? Upcoming, uh, an exhibition opening this coming Thursday at Modernism Gallery, just almost around the corner from here. Yeah, and it's a great gallery. They're also supporters of Lake Wake, so I would suggest you check out their um, their, <laughs> their, um, their uh, shows there. It's great get on their mailing list. And then finally, we have Richard Polsky, who is the author of three books on art. The Art Prophets, The Artists, Dealers, and Tastemakers Who Shook the Art World. I bought Andy Warhol. And then, ironically, I sold Andy Warhol too soon. <laughs> yeah, he's also a private art dealer, and he um, lives in Sausalito, which is a great place for art. So please welcome them all. Nancy is going to be acting as our moderator tonight, but they're all going to participate in the conversation. So thank you all for coming, for participating, and please enjoy the talk. Thank you, Elise. The title of this discussion is Forgers, Prophets, and Purists, A Conversation on the Art World. Using our most recent books as a starting point, Jonathan, Richard, and I will talk about the art world from our various perspectives. I'll talk about the painter David Park and why he and his colleagues can be thought of as purists in art, and also how the art world in Park's day offers a vantage point from which we can view and contrast the situations Richard and Jonathan will describe. I'll begin, followed by Richard and Jonathan. The artist as provocateur has a long history, although the motivations, methods, and intensity of that provocation have changed over time. To give an historical perspective to our discussion, I'd like to describe the scene that the important artist and teacher David Park and his colleagues Richard Diebenkorn, Elmer Bischoff, and Clifford Still inhabited in San Francisco after World War II. Artistic activity in the Bay Area at this time was centered at the California School of Fine Arts, now the San Francisco Art Institute. When Park taught there from 1945 to 1952, the instructors were serious artists. Some were war veterans, as were many of this, their students whose tuitions were funded by the GI Bill. These artists came to be known as the San Francisco School of Abstract Expressionism. At the California School of Fine Arts, there were two schools of thought centered on the two strong personalities of David Park and Clifford Still. At one point, their dif differences escalated into a shoving match at a faculty meeting an uncharacteristic and shocking event for two non-physical men. Despite their disagreements, both artists were purists in their attitudes toward the art market and their commitment to painting above all else. A dramatic example of Park's commitment to his convictions happened in 1950 <coughs> when Park abruptly renounced his abstract work, carted it away to the dump, and began painting a new kind of figuration. Park was considered a heretic for allowing representation into his work. Diebenkorn famously said, my God, what's happened to David? And the consequence was that Park worked in solitude for three years, painting <coughs> figures in everyday settings. But then, between 1953 and 1955, Diebenkorn, Bischoff, and several others decided to join Park in painting figuratively using abstract expressionist means. 
the group, that group came to be known as the Bay Area Figurative Painters. I think of Park and his colleagues as purists because they were resolutely uncommercial. They posed artistic questions to themselves and answered them through painting. This is what motivated their work. They didn't paint for a known or imagined collector or a dealer ready to buy or promote their art. The San Francisco Art Association's annual exhibitions were the primary way for artists to show their work as late as the 1950s. The most avant-garde galleries at the time, the King Ubu Gallery, the Six Gallery, and the Maytart Gallery, were alternative or cooperative spaces. It wasn't until later decades that major dealers and important commercial galleries arrived on the scene. Also, there were few critics in the Bay Area to call attention to the artist's work and to the real artistic advances that originated here, sometimes ahead of what was happening in New York. At that time, San Francisco artists did not go looking for a dealer, something that Richard is going to talk about. It was considered bad form. Park didn't have a New York dealer until George Stemfley found him in 1959. Park died of cancer in 1960, the next year, at the age of 49. During the last year of his life and in the decades after his death, Park's work gained national, national acclaim, entered museums and important collections, and influenced many artists nationally and internationally. The battles between abstraction and figuration in Park's lifetime obscured the fact that his work pointed to something beyond the two categories. He transformed abstract expressionism's unbounded spaces and non-objectivity to suggest the space of the natural world in which humans exist. In the 60s and beyond, the art world saw large changes as, as we will hear from Richard Polsky. And we look forward to what you will tell us about some of the art world visionaries you've chronicled and what we might learn from them. And Jonathan, we'll look forward to hearing from you how forgery is a lens through which to view changing definitions and social values of art. We hope you'll tell us about your artistic practice and how it relates to your investigation of forgery. Jonathan, uh, Richard. Thank you, Nancy. Anyway, I think what makes the most sense here is to segue into the Bay Area art scene as, I, as I've personally experienced it. I came out here in 1978 and the first thing I did was take a class at the San Francisco Art Institute as a way of connecting with the community, meeting girls, you know, learning about what was going on in the Bay Area. The thing is though, what Nancy wrote about David Park and the Bay Area figurative artists, that was actually the last great moment, I hate to say this, in the Bay Area in terms of art. Nothing has come since then. I mean, in terms of, I think, anything of national significance. This is just my opinion. Uh, that was like the last great moment was, you know, the 50s and 60s here. By the time I came here in 78, it was too late already. By that I mean, when I took a class, I took one class at the Art Institute, it was called Advanced Sculpture, and it was taught by someone named Jim Pomeroy. Does anyone know who Jim Pomeroy is? Really? All right, someone else, yes. All right, so you go into class, and the whole thing made no sense. It had nothing to do with art, was my point. Nobody was painting, nobody was drawing, everyone was just talking. Like one guy would come to class and say, okay, I'm gonna present a piece today. He walked in, this is a true story, with a, a, a bunch of bananas. Walks in on a scale. He, he walks into class, he puts the scale down, and he gets on it, and he weighs himself. And I think he weighed 150 pounds or something. And he says, okay, I'm gonna start eating bananas till I weigh 152 pounds. <laughs> he peels a banana and starts eating it, all right? And I'm going, I'm paying money for this, you know, <laughs> to study art here. And this is what it was like. The punk scene was happening in the 70s. You had a lot of the students there were in bands. That was more happening than the art. Romeo Void was a big part of it. A woman named Deborah Hill was a student there. A lot of the mutants were students. Um, 
So my point is, nobody was painting or drawing or making prints. If they were, it was almost like a peripheral activity. Everyone was talking and posturing. One guy wanted to study the insect life around the Art Institute. You know, it, it was nonsense. It was utter nonsense. The thing with David Park that's interesting is by 78, when I came here, there was a gallery called Maxwell Galleries. It was on Sutter Street. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yes. Mark Hoffman, I think, was the yes. name. And the weirdest thing I saw there was David Park. I didn't know who he was. And I was looking at these paintings, and they had, you know, the blocky kind of brush strokes and drips, thick paint, figures, but not real defined. You know, you're like, what is this? And the weird thing is, they were only like five, six, seven thousand dollars at the time. And I thought, God, who's wasting their buddy on this? But the weird thing is, the work stayed with me. I kept thinking about it, which is a good sign. And I realized, though, after a few years, he was the real deal. But so, you know, the problem, you know, you talk about authenticity and you talk about fakes, forgeries, what's the real deal? And it's really, it's, it's a frustrating thing here in the Bay Area. And I don't want to sound negative because it's a wonderful place to live. We've got a great art museum. There are a lot of wonderful artists who live here. But there's, in my opinion, Park and Bischoff and Diebenkorn, and even Hassel Smith, Jay DeFeo, all these people, Wally Hedrick, that was like a last moment. It was a last hurrah. And I keep waiting for something to fill the vacuum here. I keep waiting for something to come out of the Art Institute or CCAC, or even SF MoMA to take the lead and, you know, bring something cohesive, you know, get people moving, get people talking about art, get them to participate. And all everyone you know, at the museum seems to do is care about Sika, and we're going to give an award, and we've done our part. So I think you know, the roundabout thing I'm coming to is what Nancy has written about was really the last great moment here. And um, it's wonderful that the museum will show the Fisher Collection. There are a lot of good galleries when you go to 49 Gary. But for me, there's just a sense of frustration that um, I, people just don't seem to care like they used to about just good painting and sculpture, and I'd like to see more of that happen here. Anyway, what do you think? Well, I, I think that perhaps this is the optimal argument for why we need to move beyond painting and sculpture. Perhaps, okay. with all due respects to with all due respect to David Park and others, that perhaps what you are seeing or what you saw with a man eating bananas is not so reprehensible because in fact it is absurd in a way that clearly has affected you and is as memorable to you as the David Park works that you saw. Now I'm not going to defend the bananas or the man who was eating them, but, I, but neither am I going to ridicule him. I have attempted to write a book that is an argument that kind of turns, turns in on itself, that really I think pertains to a lot of the questions that you uh, have brought up about you know, what's become of art within the Bay Area and is there any future for it. Uh, my book is ostensibly about art forgery and about forgers as the great artists of our time. And the reason that I make this argument has nothing whatsoever to do with the quality or lack thereof of their work as painters or sculptors. Some of them were, in fact, very talented at a technical level, others were not. What interests me, rather, is the result that their forgeries have had and that forgers' work has on our society. What I would say my foundation for this is is a distillation of what I think art fundamentally is and has been about in our time, since the late 19th century, at least perhaps before. And that is that art is fundamentally in the business of anxiety, of provoking our anxieties about ourselves and our world, and making us, in various ways, more reflective, um, seeing things from other perspectives, and therefore living more fully, perhaps. And that straight artists have done this, and done it well, in terms of 
for instance, David Park in the way that his perspective quite literally disorients you and really makes you look at things all over again in an entirely new way. Warhol, who you've written about at length, is also an example in an entirely different way of this coming out of the straight art world of an artist who takes commodities and basically turns them around, makes them into icons in a way that the relationship that we have to them, which always has been one of worship at a certain level, is made explicit. He's doing many other things, but that is one way in which he is provoking us to address some of the kind of underlying phenomena, the underlying ideas, um, the underlying assumptions that operate in our society. To me, though, these artists are more or less, and Warhol may be the great exception, confined to the gallery and museum space and really are seen only by a very small select group of people and the way in which they provoke anxiety, and again, Warhol may be the great exception to this, tends to be at the level of what I would call illustration. Um, illustrating something that is other in order to get us out of our own space. Forgers don't interest me for their own work in terms of the technical skill, as I said earlier, but rather for the scandal that ensues when they get caught. <laughs> that is to say, when a great forger has managed to dupe all of us, what happens in that scandal, I think, is a deeply humiliating but highly productive process of self-reflection. The galleries or museums that were duped, for instance, um, the financial level at which art operates, but more broadly questions of authenticity, of what we, what we consider to be real versus not uh, in a society that lives more or less on television and the internet. These are questions that are highly productive and that come up when suddenly something that was real at some level is not at another and yet is perhaps at yet another. So what I am arguing in this book is not so much that forgers are the great artists of our age, but that artists need to be more attentive to forgers and forgery, not to become forgers, um, because forgers ultimately are limited by the fact that they don't want to be great artists in the sense that I'm arguing that they are. They don't want to get caught. And the whole business of forgery is sort of at odds with this um, self-reflection, societal self-reflection that I believe to be the great redeeming quality in art. So artists, I believe, need to get out into the world more, to eat more bananas on the scale, <laughs> but to do it in public, not in the art school. Perhaps we need to shut down the art schools as a point of departure for, for doing this. There needs to be more of an infiltration of artists into the world, into the systems uh, of our society that undermines them ultimately in the way that Park does from the, at the level of visual perspective, in the way that Warhol does at the level of how we think of commodities and how we think, how we think of high and low and his upset of what was exalted and what was denigrated. That this needs to be more broadly the attack made by artists within the arts, that are within the arts, that it needs to be, in fact, a full frontal assault. Um, so, ultimately, forgers lead the way, but then need to get out of the way. And I would put forward that we need to move forward as writers as well as artists in terms of making that happen. And so, maybe to loop back around to to Nancy and to have you talk about ways in which, because I, I think that this is something that you certainly have written about in your book, to do with how Park did this within his own, uh, with, amongst his peers. Because that may be the starting point, the way in which he broke with his peers in order to then bring them around to 
uh, to open up their world. Maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, and then we can kind of move back through this, and then I can be clobbered on left and right for my uh, intemperate views. Oh, I, I don't think they're intemperate at all, and I think that the the idea of uh, uh, oh, sorry. The idea of the artist as provocateur is, and, and our noticing that and, and bringing it out as you do in what you're talking about in the forgery, in your forgery book, um, I think um, that it, it, was, it was instructive for me to look back at David Park with those points in mind, which are maybe more modern points than that you're, that you're bringing, or contemporary points. Um, but David Park was very well mannered, and you know seemed quite part of part of the crowd. But he really was a rebel, and he really was a pro provocateur. These the paintings that he did when he changed from abstraction to figuration were deceptively illustrational, but they weren't. He he had uh, there was never a conventional point of view. In, in the, and he was always getting the viewer to bring, he was trying to get the viewer to come in, to participate in the viewing, in the, in the painting. Um, for example, putting, and, and he was also uh, trying to uh, uh, attack the conventions of, the, of abstract expressionism, which at the time had the force of religion. Mm. And uh, and he was an agnostic, but um, for example, you weren't supposed to break the picture plane. You weren't. So he made a, a figure way up in the front of the of the painting, or he would put a tennis ball or volleyball right where the in the face, right in the place where the face should be, so you couldn't see it. And uh, he was also going against the abstract expressionist tenets of uh, perspective, or it, he, he made very deep holes in the painting. So, you, so you, that did not meet with what a professor at Berkeley or the Art Institute would, would accept. And he was subverting all of that. And I do think that uh, uh, yet, and his, yet his friends, um, sorry, yet, <laughs> yet his friends joined him in, play, in painting figuratively, and although they didn't carry that uh, kind of strange, weird perspective as far as, as he did, but he certainly brought them along to realize that, that this new painting used abstract expressionist means, but it was also use figures um, and maybe, maybe it would be interesting to get Richard's perspective on why that died with his generation um, in other words why within the art world in the Bay Area why have there not been strong voices um, provocateurs in that way who could break and reconsolidate the uh, the art world in new terms. Hmm. Jonathan, I also uh, I wanted to add uh, a question, which is that, uh, or I wanted to add the fact that David Park also was influ he influenced the beat artists, and uh, he was older than they were, but he was important to them. And they included him. And so you, I would say that in your question to Richard, I'd like to say that you also have to consider the beat artists who were Jess and Wally Hedrick, and then Wally and Hedrick Bruce and, Connor. and Bruce Connor. And they lead you to quite modern, quite uh, ideas that go on for quite a while. Well, I mean, Certainly, I agree that one of the jobs of an artist is to provoke you a little, get you to see the world in a different way. Um, the reason someone like Andy Warhol was considered so radical was when he did a painting of a soup can. I mean, this seems like nothing right now, but back in the day in 62, when he did that, it was to get you to look at 
your experience. Um, the next time you went shopping for groceries, you'd see these rows of red and white Campbell soup cans, row after row in the Brillo boxes, and you'd realize there's potential beauty and visual stimulation all around you. So yeah, that was one job of an artist, to provoke you into thinking different, seeing the world in a different way, and hopefully enjoying your life a lot more. But where I, where I come from, I'm more interested in artists, not as provocateurs, I'm more interested in artists who create paintings or sculpture or drawings where I feel something. That's, that's to me the authenticity issue, and I find that to be such a rare experience. Most art you see, I think of it as a one-liner. In other words, you look at a painting, you go, okay, and you move on to the next picture. The great art brings you back over and over again, and each time you see it, you feel something new, or you see something different in the picture that transports you, it takes you somewhere. Um, and maybe that's just too traditional and too, too ordinary of a way to look at things. But the whole thing for me is, provocation's a very cool thing, but I want to feel something. I want, I want to, you know, I'll give you an example. I've been looking a lot at Western art lately, like cowboy art, cowboys lassoing, and I'm not talking about the older guys, like you've heard of Russell and Remington, great stuff. Um, but there, there are all these artists now in Arizona and New Mexico who I think of as contemporary artists even though the subject matter is very traditional. Horses, mountains, cattle. And I look at this stuff, we're talking about the good stuff, not the stuff when you go to Santa Fe on Canyon Road where you know the coyotes have bandanas on and they're howling, <laughs> not that stuff. We're talking about the guys who actually can really paint and create a feeling. And I look at this stuff, again, the best of the best, and I'm like, wow, why can't artists these days paint like that anymore? Even someone like, do you all know who Mel Ramos is, for instance? Show of hands, Mel Ramos. Most of you know who he is. Mel Ramos lives over in Oakland. He's the Bay Area's um, you know, big link to the pop era. Um, he, he shows with Modernism Gallery where Jonathan shows. I wrote an essay about him actually. Did you? The, there's, yeah. an, there's an exhibition that's, currently that's at the Crocker Art Museum, yeah. uh, which is well worth going to. Well, Mel's an example, and let's say Wayne Tebow, obviously, we all know that. These are examples, and I'll throw another name out there, Christopher Brown, all right? These are all people who actually know how to paint. Now, you be the judge whether you like what you're seeing, if their ideas are good, you know, if the content interests you, but at least, you know, they bring something to the table. You go, okay, that guy can draw and paint. And it's almost like, you know, back in the day, the thing with de Kooning was always, he was a great draftsman. That's what gave him permission to create those women, you know, with, with the bodies and the grotesque faces. He could get away with that because the fundamentals were there, he could do it. And as time went on, that all started fading out. And I, I, I'm fascinated by this, how everyone gets away with what they do. And it's now at a point where what Warhol started was, you have guys like Jeff Koons and Takashi Murakami and uh, obviously Damien Hirst, where they've all, you know, they're considered three of our greatest living artists. And the funny thing is, I don't know what these guys really are. They're art directors. They, they're, like, they're like Francis Ford Coppola, where they pull the different elements together. And it is a talent to get people to create your own work for you. But wasn't this hire. also true in the, <laughs> work, in the, in the workshops of, um, of the Renaissance? Yeah, of course. We know there's always been a history of artists having apprentices. There have always been systems where artists had assistants. That's one thing, and I think there's a validity to that because those people really had to study hard. It's like becoming, it was like becoming a great chef. You had to earn it. You had to be a sous chef. And then a prep or a prep cook and a line cook and then you were promoted and you know you learned your craft and all that so again if you come full circle to an artist like david park these guys actually knew how to do something um, you know and it fascinates me what everyone gets away with now but why is it getting away with something to reject painting as somehow being the way in which art is manifest in the world. Painting has been around for an awfully long time, and paint 
is comprised of only a few of the chemicals that we have access to, not to mention all of the ideas that don't necessarily need any sort of chemistry. What is it about painting that you want to uphold painting as something privileged within the world of art, essentially to equate the one with the other? What do you think? <laughs> you want to answer that one? Well, what do you think? I do come from the. Well, you've tossed it to me, but thank you. Okay, I'll answer it. But <laughs> I'd rather lose. I know. I'd love to hear what you have no. to say. That, but. All right. Well, I, I come from, I do, kind of. Privilege painting. Uh, because I think it is such an infinitely challenging and satisfying. Uh, way to make art. But I also see um, the idea of, of Jonathan's talking about other kinds of, of ways of, of making art and even including what you, uh, when you were talking um, in your book, when you were writing about Virginia Dwan and the uh, the earthwork artists mm -hmm. who did things that you couldn't buy, you couldn't own them, and they were out in the world. Uh, I mean, there are many values. Our, art is our way of, of expressing important things that we believe in, and so, um, and there are many important lessons to, or many important ways of doing that. Yeah. Well. See, um, maybe this sounds very traditional, but I believe art is first and foremost a visual experience. I want to see something. That's why I go to a museum or go to a gallery or go to a friend's studio. I want to be stimulated by that. I want it to be thought-provoking and tug at my heartstring or transport me somewhere or make me feel good or bad or something. I want, I'm looking for the emotional content. Um, and it can come in any form. Like I wrote in this book, there's a, it's called The Art Prophets. And what I did was I tried to find 10 individuals who were the catalysts who discovered new artists and new movements. For instance, like you had pop art. Ivan Karp found Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, and a number of people. And I wanted to sh inform the reader as to how did these guys do it? How did they see these things early on? And then you know ignite that fuse and move things forward. Nancy mentioned the earthwork artists. Does everyone know who Robert Smithson is, the spiral jetty? I'm assuming a lot of you do. Um, does anyone who, know who Walter De Maria is and the lightning yeah. field? All right. I know Walter De Maria. Okay. All right. The greatest work of art I have ever seen is the lightning field. Now, that's just my opinion. I'm not saying everyone has to agree with me. But in terms of emotional content and visual stimulation, I've never seen anything like this. For those of you who don't know about it, Walter Di Maria constructed in an area, it's Cuemado, New Mexico. It's in the southwest corner of New Mexico. He found some open land where there was a high degree of electrical activity. There were a lot of storms there during the summer. And he got these stainless steel poles. They were approximately 22 feet tall. And he sharpened them at the tip. They came to a point. And he laid them out. There are hundreds of these over, in a grid pattern, over one square mile. And when they first allowed the public to go to it, you got to sign up. You had to call in and make an appointment. And they insisted you stay 24 hours. They had all these rules. They drive you out to the property. They give you a shortwave radio. I mean, this is the days before cell phones and whatnot. And they give you a tray of lasagna. That was your meal. And it was not good lasagna, I might add. Very, very tasteless. <laughs> anyway, and they'd say, you know, there are snakes. Watch out. You know, be careful. You know, if there's an emergency, call us on the shortwave radio. But the essence of earthworks is this idea of isolation which allows you to take in you know, the grandeur of the landscape. And if you live with a work of art, can you imagine living with something 24 hours? That's all you're, all right, you take time out to sleep and all that, but you experience it during different times of the day. And when the light would hit these stainless steel poles at around noon, they'd vanish. It would create this funny thing. And then you know, at one o'clock, it was almost like getting a sugar rush, where your teeth felt like they were like buzzing, because you'd watch these poles, they'd radiate. 
I never saw any lightning. I don't know anyone who's ever seen any lightning who's been out there. But that's besides the point. It got you to think about the possibility of seeing lightning. And the idea was it would hit a post and it would jump from one to the other. It almost would dance across it and create, that would you know, activate the work of art. But it was almost besides the point. And this is an embarrassing confession. But I was so, I went there on my honeymoon um, during my first marriage, right? And uh, I don't know why I did this, but I felt, I, I'm like, I'm saying to this woman, her name is Leah, I go, I'm in the middle of fucking nowhere. We can do whatever we want here. So I remember taking off all my clothes. I left my tennis shoes on because I was afraid of the snakes. And I walked around this thing and touched it and looked at it. And I was like, this is all unbelievable. And then at night as the sun set on it, I mean, all right, I'm not saying looking at every painting that you come across, you're going to have this catharsis and you're going to want to take your clothes off or, or cry or laugh. I mean, you know, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm getting carried away here. But that's what art does. That's the value of it. I don't care if it's a forgery. It can be a great forgery. It can be the real thing. It can be the Mona Lisa or a reproduction you see for 59 cents in Chinatown. You know, whatever it is, whatever floats your boat, you know, what, it, it doesn't matter. But to me, that's what it's about, looking for that experience wherever you find it with whatever artist you find it with. There. I'd like to just uh, connect, I'd like to make a connection between Walter De Maria and David Park. Hard one to imagine, but... Uh, it's hard to imagine. <laughs> Say it again? That is hard to that imagine. That is hard to imagine. Yeah. However, uh, Walter De Maria was a student of David Park, and I write about him in my book, and he was one of the most eloquent, of, uh, he didn't say a lot, but he what he said was very eloquent, and um, he was, uh, David Park was very important to Walter de Maria. And when I went to visit Walter, who, and, and although Walter de Maria's work is not, uh, does not look like David Park's painting, um, he, he was a student at Berkeley at, at, in, the end, in David Park's career. And uh, so when I went to Walter de Maria's uh, studio and house in New York, he had only one painting on the wall, and it was a studio drawing that David Park uh, did, a, a demonstration drawing that David Park did in class and gave to Walter de Maria, um, the model, uh, that uh, was in the classroom. And uh, I, I was, and I think that when we are, when we are, we, we need to be open-minded because we don't, David Park did not know where Walter de Maria's art would lead. It led him very far afield, but he was an inspiration that he credits, so I think that's kind of interesting. Sorry. I think that maybe, Richard, your definition of provocation is perhaps narrower than, than mine, because to me, what you're describing um, in your eloquent description of your experience at the lightning field, it seems to me that that would be a perfect example of how the lightning field brought you out of yourself, out of your everyday assumptions, your, your everyday of engaging in society. I'm guessing here that this is not something that you ordinarily, that you don't go around flashing people ordinarily. Um, so I did go streaking once in college. OK, well, <laughs> that to me, it seems like it really is operating at the level of provocation in this broader sense of drawing you out of yourself and getting you to, um, to see the assumptions that you make, that you make implicitly, that are necessary for you to get by in the world on a day-to-day -day basis. But in order for you to do that in this case, not only did you have to endure some abominable lasagna, but you had to be one of the select few who has gotten out there. And that is one of the great merits of that work and also of some of the work of um, Terrell and some of the other artists who have worked at monumental scale out in nature. But it is necessarily a limited and limiting ex experience in terms of who has access to it. So to me, it seems that that needs somehow to be universalized. 
And that needs to be not only universalized, but brought to people who would never go out to the lightning field, let alone go to SFMOMA. And that, to me, is why painting ultimately is just too static. Painting is great and well worthwhile and more rewarding the more time you spend with it. I, I write about it admiringly um, and enjoy it immensely. But ultimately, what our society seems to need most that no one else is able to or willing to provide and that artists can is this sort of engagement that takes place outside of the everyday practical needs of getting by in the world. Something that is useless in the most useful way. That is even more fundamentally what art, what art is and what it does. And yet it only does so for the select few. And so I think that what I'm attempting to do um, in my own work, as well as by promoting the work of forgers, is to say that artists can abandon all of these techniques that are necessarily limited and limiting because they just don't get out in the world. They don't weather well, they don't travel well, and find, find things that do travel, work within the media, work within the political structure, make art in these ways. And this is certainly nothing new, but generally speaking, the way in which it has been done in the past, Joseph Boyce being a great example of this, has been incredibly opaque and ultimately self-serving, um, has ultimately been very much in this tiresome argument that has been going on since uh, Duchamp ostensibly liberated art from, uh, from its roots. This constant um, reiterate, basically, that, that Duchamp gave us permission to question everything, and that artists either ignore that and continue to see painting as the only way, or that they choose to use that freedom they have to question to question art all over again, and again, and again, and again. And, it's sort of tiresome and ultimately hermetic, productive in the way that things that hermetic are, but I think that art also can break free of that, 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 that sort of Duchampian move, that is to say, that making art out of everything, taking society and sculpting it, re-sculpting it, remaking it, uh, revisioning it, re-envisioning it, these are the sorts of things that no one else is doing, and artists can through visual and through other other means. Jonathan, can you tell about your own work and how you uh, deal with these questions as it relates to your own work? Do you, do you achieve this kind of, um, I mean, do you get out of the hermetic world and do, are you able to make something that is broader and use more available to other people. Yeah. Okay. In the interest of full disclosure, I own two of Jonathan's pieces. <laughs> I own, this is absurd, but a number of shows ago, Jonathan decided to sell his brain. That was his piece. It was a conceptual well, art piece. Not shares piece. of your brain. Uh, no, I, actually, I, I own two shares. I mean, I, I, paid, shares. I paid forty dollars. Twenty dollars per share. He owes a futures contract that this is, is true. no. You owe if you if you read the prospectus that I issued. I never we'll read see. it. I never read <laughs> it. Exactly. I, I felt sorry for him. I gave him forty bucks. You know, <laughs> sorry. sorry. All right, tell him. Tell him what it is. Okay. Well, no. Uh, go ahead. Right. Anyway, Jonathan is a conceptual artist. That's my understanding. A broad, broad definition. And he did a show at Modernism where he decided to sell, you know, if I understood this correctly, like shares of stock. He was selling, selling um, shares of your brain, which would be donated to science once you died or something? I, um, you know, and I then I'd collect issued, I issued, when he died. Well, I, I issued um, futures contracts on my brain. I, I wanted to attain immortality because that's what artists are supposed to do. And so I figured that perhaps I could do so in some roundabout uh, way of exploiting a legal loophole, as I saw it, which was the Copyright Act of 1978, which basically gives 
a writer, an artist, anyone who creates any sort of intellectual property, um, a 70 year span past that person's death in which they, they own that property or their, their estate does. And so my idea was that basically anything could be copyrighted. So therefore there was no reason why, uh, why my mind could not be, uh, in a sense. It was a sculpture that, uh, that the neural networks were being created through the act of thinking, and I was the one doing the thinking, so therefore there seemed to be intellectual property content to this. So the idea was to, to apply for copyright, which I did, on my mind, and then to, subsequent to my death, to license that in a way that would effectively keep me alive by way of the Copyright Act of 1978 past my own death for, not eternity, but 70 years. But I knew that that was going to be expensive, uh, legal battles and so forth. Um, I mean, we've all been reading about Apple and Samsung. So you, you realize that you need some sort of financial basis for the holding company to operate. And so what you did was you purchased futures contract on my brain, not my mind, but on the neurons themselves. You bought the right to purchase a million neurons upon my death at 1,000% um, uh, premium per neuron against a one cent per neuron strike price. So you actually don't own those neurons and only upon my death will you be able to exercise that contract should you choose to do so. If you do, that money will then go to the holding company which will then be able to exploit my brain in a way, that, or rather be able to exploit my mind by way of copyright in a way that will keep me alive past my own death. You got it's it. It's very simple. You all got that. Right? Well, anyway, I lost my two shares in one of my divorces, so I, I, guess, I guess I'm not going to be collecting. Them. Well, you can always buy but more. I could buy more. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I don't know. Do, do you guys have any great questions for us? Anybody? We have a, we have a mic here. So. Okay. Nancy, do you want to sure. entertain questions? Tracy? Why am I? Hi. Hi. Um, it's very interesting. I did want to ask Jonathan a little more because there have been a couple uh, recent very unpleasant things in the art world around forgeries or alleged forgeries. And um, I'm just curious, you know, to hear more of what you think about why, why do we care so much? I mean, because I see a picture reproduced endlessly or film. I don't sit around saying that's a forgery or it's, that's better, that's worse. Why do we why do we care so much? I think that in a way you're you're answering your own question. That is to say that most everything that we encounter is at some level in reproduction or in quantity is um, is mass produced. And it seems that if you look at the history of forgery as a concern, as something that in fact is. Um, uh, denigrated or even that is um, threatening to society as opposed to something that is admired, you find that, that that coincides roughly with the Industrial Revolution and with um, with the advent of technology that effectively makes it so that um, most everything is, well, most almost nothing is special in that way of being unique. And therefore, there's a sense of violation, I think, that people feel when those things that were or the, which they believed to be unique no longer proved to be. But to me, this is one of the great examples of how forgery can be ultimately redeeming in terms of asking exactly that sort of question. Is there a reason why we should ultimately value something for its uniqueness? Maybe yes, but that seems to me to be a question that we ought to be asking rather than an assumption that we should simply be making out of hand. Hi, Jonathan. Hello. Nice to see you. Good to see you. You've been a provocateur for about the last 10 years, haven't you? We're now in cross-examination mode. <laughs> I mean, I, I would hope that I have been for my my entire life. I, uh, when I was a child, would sell rocks on the street corner that were <laughs> like all the other rocks uh, on the street corner. And the act of selling the rocks was what might be now considered a work of conceptual art, but at the time it just seemed to me to be a way to make a little bit of pocket money. 
No one ever bought them, so it actually didn't work. That <laughs> just made it better. So you've been doing this for a long time, is the point. And I just wondered how being a provocateur has changed you, or has it? Well, I guess that what I said a moment ago, that I was selling rocks when I was six years old. I always kind of have been, I don't think that I can call myself a provocateur. I, I think that it is something that others can, can name call you in the best possible way, and I am honored that you would think that I am. I think that I have always sought to question everything and to involve others as best I can in that sort of curi in that, that broadest sort of curious quest to uh, to understand the world through this iterative process of question, this Talmudic process, if you will, of, of questioning everything. So I don't think I can take any sort of credit for it if it's any good. I think that it was just, you know, born that way. But that's not the question. Has it changed you as, a, as an artist, however you define yourself? But, but the trouble is that change implies that there was some, uh, some me prior to that who was um, painting the coyotes with the neckties. Um, in, um, in Santa Fe. So, you know, to me this just seems like the natural thing that one would do. I mean, everything just seems so strange. <laughs> and therefore, everything seems so interesting to prod and poke that I wouldn't know how not to do it. But I don't think that you would know how not to do it either. Okay, point taken. But I, I just wondered if emotionally have you changed as a result of all these these provocations that you Well, uh, you know, it, it, I think that it's an interesting question, but <laughs> again, it is a question that involves change. And so we could look at this from the standpoint of as you accumulate more acts of provocation, does that have some sort of uh, effect on you in terms of the provocations that you attempt in the future? And yes, there probably is something addictive to it, something addictive about it. I mean, I would urge everyone to try it. It really seems to me to be probably one of the uh, more alluring and uh, more sustainable addictions that one can have. So yes, at that level, I would say that emotionally, probably it, it has changed and it continues to change. Any Hi, uh, I'd like to go back to maybe minute four of this presentation. <laughs> um, and Richard, you were talking about how there hadn't been a movement in the Bay Area uh, since the one that you arrived a little too late for. Um, have you seen it elsewhere, or maybe elsewhere outside of New York? Is maybe a better question. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good question, actually. I mean, there are always, I don't want to sound like there's nothing going on here. There's a guy, let's say, like Barry McGee, for instance, who I think is doing something interesting. You know who Barry McGee is? Doesn't he have a show? Is it Berkeley right now? Yes. He's a, I hate to call him a street artist like Basquiat or Keith Haring, but it's related to that where he finds inspiration in the Mission District and finds discarded bottles from winos and those paintings and faces on them and assembles them. It's kind of cool. I mean, th there are moments scattered here and there, but there is, I mean, the last real s scene was probably like the East Village in New York. There was a moment where artists got together and opened their own galleries because there was cheap rent in the, what they called Alphabet City in New York. And that became kind of more of a real estate scene where these artists would fix up these buildings 
and the people who owned them were like, you know, they gave them cheap rent initially, and once the building started to happen, and the collectors descended, and they pull up in their limos, and the whole thing got fixed up. Naturally, the artists were, of course, forced out and had to move on, but it was a moment. So there have been, I wouldn't call them movements, but there were little miniature scenes that developed. But art is such an individual activity. If you went to any of the pop artists, you know, they wouldn't, they would be offended if you told them they were a pop artist. Artists are individuals. It's dealers and collectors and critics who come up with these titles and movements and, you know, to identify them, to give us a look, to hang, you know, just to have some understanding of who they are. It's a lot easier if you say pop artist. You say, oh, Tom Wesselman, Roy Lichtenstein, Klaus Oldenburg. You know, you say earthwork artists, you know, you say Robert Smithson and Michael Heiser and Nancy Holt and, and so on. But there, you know, it's, I, there are, I don't, do you know of any metal movements well, that have really, why the nostalgia then? Why, why do you feel nostalgic for uh, the period of David Park, given that certainly he would have, uh, maybe he wouldn't have punched your lights out, that more seems to be uh, the because, way. But. Yeah, because back then, artists were much more interested in making art, and this is a whole different discussion, but what it's involved into is they're more interested in careers in the art market. Artists are, and again, this is a whole different thing, we don't need to get into this, but I think back in the day when Park was painting, your audience were, were your, your other artists, your fellow artists. It was about going to each other's studio and commenting and critiquing and searching and improving and sharing. And it's just not like that now. And I'm not saying the art world's a bad place and, you know, it keeps evolving. That's okay. It's fine. It goes where it goes. But I'm just saying I kind of preferred that world where there just seemed to be more of a search for the sublime and the beautiful and you know, what made us, you know, feel special to be alive. As opposed to now, where the artists are all like, man, you know, I'm jetting off here and I gotta be in Documenta, and now I'm going down to Basel, Miami to participate, and I don't find that that interesting. If you're interested but in what percentage percentage the of celebrity the culture. Art, how many, what percentage of the people making art are you really talking about mm -hmm. when you speak of the jet setting, uh, Art Basel, Miami? You're, it's a surprisingly large number, you know, of people. I mean, all you know what the art world's come to now, it's all art fairs. Galleries are becoming, you know, I wouldn't say obsolete, but nobody, you go to New York, no one's in the galleries. It, it's all changing. I don't think people realize this. It's all art fairs. I mean, but you have Ars Electronica, for instance, which is, in fact, a place where an awful lot of work that you couldn't possibly sell if you tried, in the same way that you couldn't possibly sell the lightning field if you tried where that's taking place. Yeah, I mean, of course, again, this becomes a whole far-reaching thing, what's going on in the art scene, how has the art world changed, what are people buying and talking about, but, um, you know, it's just where it's gone. I, I don't know what, you know, to say beyond that. He wants his microphone. Hi. Well, I, no, I don't necessarily need a microphone. Um, I thought they were doing it for the film. Yeah, yeah they are. Okay. Um, yeah, I had a question about um, your opinions of Exit Through the Gift Shop, which deals with, which is a film, for those who haven't seen it, uh, created by Banksy, which brings up, I think, a lot of the questions that you both are, all three of you are discussing. Um, and also, a uh, second question would have to do with your, uh, you say about the, the art fairs. Um, I recently moved to the Bay Area as well, and uh, the art murmurs, uh, the first Fridays, um, and the question of how art and ceramics used to be divided and now seem to be more united and how that relates to like the art fair. So there's actually two questions, sorry. Um, Have you guys seen Exit Through the Gift Shop? No. Do you, yes. have, you know who Banksy is? Yes. Yeah. I mean, any thoughts? I think that Banksy is perhaps one of the greatest living artists. Um, not for exit through the gift shop, however. Uh, to me, what is interesting about Banksy is um, the way in which his work, which uses paint, uh, some of it sometimes, does so in a world that is not only accessible to everybody, 
but encountered by people, whether they like it or not, whether you want to see his work or not, there's a way in which he perpetrate, perpetrates surprise um, in ways that you see something that comes from outside of the everyday within the context of the everyday. To me, that is about as interesting as art can get. I don't think that he is the greatest artist that there could be in our time, but I think that he is a substantial and significant uh, artist who has played games within games, and Exit from the Gift Shop is one of the games within games that probably is not especially um, interesting ultimately, because it kind of operates in this realm of is it real or isn't it that kind of ultimately short circuits. Um, it's a question that's been asked an awful lot in many more uh, open-ended ways than, than, than I think that he does in the case of that movie. But uh, I think that maybe as far as your ceramics question, that Nancy would be the ideal person to address that. I'm sorry, I didn't quite get this. The, 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 the way that contemporary art um, is fusing ceramics with art, for example, the California College of the Arts used to be called the, the, car, the Arts and Crafts, but then they yes. took off the crafts part. There's also in the, in the uh, art room of the Oakland, California, the Oakland Museum of California, uh, there's a question that's posed, which is, what is art? And it shows you um, a, a basket, a Native American basket alongside of a basket made of telephone wires, alongside of a basket made of or, um, hemp actually growing from the ground, and the audience or the public has to choose what is art. So it seems like this question of what is contemporary art as it relates to uh, ceramics and the artisan work um, is relevant, or it's a question that the East, that the East Bay, the, you know, the Bay Area is asking perhaps. Well, I would say that our definition of the of the means of 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 art has expanded. All we can't we just can't live in the world we do and not and only have a narrow definition. And I would think that and in the case of crafts or in the case of ceramics, it has to do with the intention. I think whether the work is a work of art or is a teapot that you're going to pour your tea out of, um, which it could be both, but. Uh, Whose intention, the intention of the maker or of the viewer? Well, I would say the maker, but you're right, it's also the viewer. No, I think it's the maker. Why? I think the maker gets to decide, but, <laughs> but you would probably say that the viewer has equal rights. Or, or I wouldn't, I'm not going to tell you. No, no, I, I, I mean, to me, absolutely everything can be looked at as art. That's a perfectly legitimate thing that you can always do with anything. The question is, is it, a sen is it productive or interesting or a worthwhile pursuit in many yeah. cases to classify it as such? Um, the artist can do this, the viewer can do this, we all can do this. But I don't see any reason why the artist necessarily um, is in a better position to do so. Certainly, uh, making my own work, I feel like I know the least about it of anybody. So I would certainly put others forward before me to okay. say what it meant and to say whether, whether it was or was not art. And ultimately, I really don't much care whether or not it is art as long as the art world somehow provides a space in which it's possible to undertake these sorts of experiments and meaning and light in the world. And Richard, you would have to say that... Um, I would say one more question. <laughs> we're, 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 we're running we're out of time. Right over, but if yeah. you'd like to keep continue yeah. asking your questions, please do so. I was going um, to say, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I know we had an hour. We want to, so we yeah, yeah. Right. I just sorry. want to thank oh. Thanks for coming. Uh, our panel and thank you. And thank all of you for coming. Take a program. I uh, want to thank Berkeley Extension for uh, bringing us here at Lake Week. And thank you so much for thank coming. You.